Hi, so today I was um, invited down to a factory in Kent by a YouTube viewer, uh, Patrick, who was in the process of decommissioning a large industrial carbon dioxide laser. This is a 1500-watt um, laser which was used for cutting sheet metal. They were actually using it for cutting sort of like one millimetre sheet, but this, this was designed to cut up to about five or six millimetre steel on a good day. The, um, the actual laser tube is mounted sort of overhead that then fires down onto a bed. The, um, the bed is an 8 by 4 foot um, just CNC table. I didn't take any footage of that because um, it was sort of covered in boxes and a bit hard to get to. Um, it was also a very noisy factory, so I just took stills and um, doing the, vo doing the uh, voiceover afterwards. It was too noisy to record on site. Now you can see the um, the, the uh, laser tube at the top. Now that central part is not the tube. The central tube is purely structural. The actual tubes are the diagonal tubes you can see all the way around the outside. Along the length of two tubes, sort of end to end, with the anodes in the centre, so the gas comes in the centre of each tube, and there's anodes at the centre, and then um, cathodes at each end, and then a mirror assembly. So there's a total of 12 mirrors, and about 24 metres in total of uh, laser cavity length. So needless to say, all these mirrors have to be precisely lined to get any output. So this was a uh, potentially very fiddly job. So once it's aligned, you, you had to be very careful to not um, not get it out of line because trying to figure out which mirror is out of line was um, extremely difficult. Now, large CO2 lasers like this use flowing gas, so it's not a case of like the um, Chinese laser cutters where you just have a tube that just, you just turn on. Um, so initially, to start it up, this was pumped down by a, a large vacuum pump, it's actually a water-cooled vacuum pump. You can just see it in the corner of this uh, picture. A mixture of CO2, nitrogen and helium, which has to be mixed in the right proportions and then flowed through the head. These then go through um, a system which regenerates CO2 and nitrogen can some part, some of that's converted to carbon monoxide and oxides of nitrogen. So um, in the control box there's these um, thermal regenerators which run at about four or five hundred degrees which convert the gases back to CO2 to um, keep the mixture performing well. The power supply for this tube is about 28,000 volts at about 1 amp. The other complication is that the cooling circuit is actually running at this voltage. So instead of water they use a substance called fluorinert, which is basically a very inert, that's quite commonly used for this sort of application. So it's got a very high dielectric strength so that this can flow around the um, circuits. The actual laser tubes are concentric. You've got the actual gas tube in the centre and then a sleeve around the outside. There's also a spiral electrode which is designed to carry the discharge along the length of the tube. I think that's mostly used when it's initially striking. This coolant is then um, goes through a heat exchanger to transfer that heat into water and there's an external water circuit with a, an outdoor chiller to uh, maintain the overall temperature and get rid of the heat. So with um, 28 kilowatts going in and only about 1500 watts coming out, yeah, almost all of the power is coming out as heat so you've got to uh, get rid of that fairly uh, rapidly. It's because this thing um, it's so reliant on this precise alignment, it mustn't get too warm because it will set, it will knock everything out of alignment. There's also these uh, ballast resistors that the uh, fluorinert coolant runs through and again um, these dissipate a huge amount of power. These sit in these sealed die cast boxes and the whole thing is uh, sitting at 28,000 volts so it's uh, not a fun thing that you want to um, be playing with but of course when you're doing alignments and so on you have to be quite careful. You need to be get, get in there and adjust mirrors and so on and then be rather careful that you don't stick your finger in the uh, 28 kV areas because you'll uh, certainly know all about it if you do. And this is the business end where the beam comes out. Um, here's the mirror. This mirror sort of deflects the beam from its horizontal axis downwards towards the work. And you can also see there's a copper water cooling pipe on the back of this mirror because obviously the mirrors will absorb a small amount of energy so you need to keep those cool. You can see a couple of micrometer adjustments. This has to be adjusted very precisely. This goes through a nozzle, which is something around the sort of one, one to two millimeter diameter, along with um, an assist gas, which um, in this case was they usually use oxygen. So this act actually works not unlike an um, oxyacetylene cutter, where you're, the laser is providing the heat and the oxygen is actually burning the um, the material. More modern lasers tend to use higher power and are less reliant on the assist gas, where the assist gas tends to be um, nitrogen, which, which is just really to blow the um, plasma and um, debris and smoke out of, the, out of the hole rather than actually participating in the cutting process. And again, um, cutting different materials, you use different assist gases depending on what, what the material characteristics are. Further down, there's this mirror that can flick into the beam path to deflect the beam into a water-cooled load dump just to basically as a quick way of turning the beam off. 
and there's a few various controls and interlocks at this end because obviously you're going to need to have the beam on at certain times for doing alignment so um, there's various interlocks and uh, safety warnings here and this is this is just a sight glass to show the level of the fluorine at coolant in the system and to allow it to be topped up and here's a few of the uh, bits of test equipment they use with this. Um, the strip of acrylic was used to look at the beam shape because that could give you some diagnostic information about the uh, mirror alignment from experience and by the shape of the pattern it produced. That could give quite a lot of information about the, um, the beam and how it needs adjusting. Then there's a cinder block which is just a simple way of dumping the power when they're doing some adjustments. And there's also a power meter which basically comprised a, a block of metal with a thermometer attached. This was used for short pulse tests because the temperature would raise once and then you'd have to let the block cool down again to get take another measurement. So, and this is one of the lenses. This is actually a fairly short focal length lens because this company only used it for doing fairly thin sheet metal. This is the power supply and control rack. Um, you can see it's dominated at the bottom by this huge great three-phase transformer. This ran off a um, three-phase four and five volt 63 amp supply produces 28,000 volts at about an amp, so about 28 kilowatts to uh, run the laser. Above the transformer we've got some rectifiers and some voltage dividers. These look like they're for voltage sensing because these go into a low voltage board at the right hand side. And you can see some big um, MOV surge suppressors on there. Um, this then goes up to this capacitor. This is um, 30 nanofarads at 40 kV and helpfully they give you a little discharge probe to uh, make sure it's discharged before you uh, stick your finger anywhere near it because this could provide a, um, a rather nasty shock even after it's been switched off. And there's a big uh, fan called wire wound current limiting resistor along the back here. And this goes, it then goes into this huge control valve. And this, I think, is a triode valve. I'm not totally sure whether this is just switching or whether this is also switching and power control. I couldn't really see anything else in there that would actually provide um, current regulation. So I suspect this may well be being either a linear mode or, or some sort of pulsing mode that was then filtered out to reduce the beam power. There was one, one additional component behind it which looks like a large sort of transformer or an inductor. It's not really quite clear exactly what that's doing. One of the things it may be being used to produce a high voltage transient to start the tubes um, but it may also be involved in current regulation. It wasn't entirely clear. And there's also this um, electronic assembly. This whole electronic assembly is elevated on top of the, 25, the um, high voltage supply and this seems to control the um, electrodes in the valve. And on the left you can see a couple of fibre optic cable connectors. These cables run to the control system at the back. Obviously this whole thing's elevated at 28 kV, so um, you need to use fairly serious isolation to avoid any uh, nasty problems occurring. And around the top of the valve there's this x-ray screen. This is actually, it actually looks like a fairly thick acrylic, um, but it has got a slight brown colour which might be some uh, additives. But Wherever you've got high voltages and vacuum, there's a potential for x-rays, but at uh, 28 kV, they're not going to be particularly hard x-rays, so something like acrylic is probably going to um, block it quite happily. Another interesting little detail, there's this interlock wire attached to the screen, so if you take off the shield, um, it then opens the interlock so you can't actually turn it on without reattaching that wire to show that the shield's in place. And going around the side with a bunch of various transformers, capacitors, a few odd, uh, just general little bits and pieces. And then around the back, a whole ton of fuses, circuit breakers, contactors, various stuff controlling all the, um, the high power stuff throughout the whole system. And then above that we've got uh, sort of some of the lower, lower power control stuff. And at the top there's a, um, a PLC, Programmer Logic Controller, that controls things like the sequencing of the, the vacuum and gas filling cycle and various other aspects of the system. There's a, a few boards with sort of various bits of electronics. I'm not completely sure what this one was. This may be, to, I noticed, just noticed on, in the photo that there's actually a, what looks like a processor on there. That may be to provide an external interface to the, um, the other CNC motion control stuff. I'm not entirely sure. Um, there's another, this is the board that those fibre optic cables come into for controlling the, um, the beam power. Again, it's really hard to see exactly what, what uh, all these do. We don't have much um, information on it. And then next to that, there's the uh, system that processes the there's all the various gas valves and gas handling um, equipment and some controls. 
to uh, manually turn on and off the uh, gas supplies and under overriding uh, locks for testing, uh, testing and setting up. But on this system I don't believe there's much in the way of act active monitoring of the gas control. It's literally to get the gas mix right. A lot of that's done by just looking at the colour of the discharge and adjusting the gas mixes. And below that are the uh, gas regenerator units I mentioned before and also a, um, the pink is the desiccator to filter out any moisture from the gas, gas supply. And this is the user control panel. This was originally mounted on the side of the rack, but this has been extended to uh, mount it on top of the CNC controller, so all the controls are in the same place. Nothing particularly interesting in the back of here. So it's quite interesting to take a look around this. It dates back from the early 1990s. Uh, Ferranti Photonics, the company that produced it, disappeared around 2005. Apparently there are still a few of these working sort of in various places around the country and around the world. This one was being decommissioned because it didn't really get used very much. The was taking up a, a lot of space. They are trying to sell it so if you're potentially seriously interested in a piece like this, either the laser or the 8x4 um, CNC bed or, or both, it's based down in Kent. So if you're seriously interested, um, please get in touch.